Okay, everyone, it's 1.30. Welcome back after our quick break. I hope you guys are ready for our next session. Uh, continuing our theme from this morning, I hope you're all ready for an afternoon packed with new and exciting research and management in the world of aquatic invasives. I do just want to give a quick reminder before I pass it over to our moderator for the afternoon. Um, the Invasive Species Center Awards are going to be given uh, annually to recognize and celebrate leadership and commitment of individuals or organizations who help keep the lands and waters of Canada free from invasive species. Our, our award ceremony is going to be taking place tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. to celebrate this year's nominees and winners. Uh, so please join in there uh, if you're available um, and help celebrate uh, the great work in invasive species management going on in Ontario. Uh, so taking us through this afternoon is going to be our Invasive Species Policy Coordinator, Jenna White. Jenna also spends much of her time focused on aquatic invasive species outreach, with her latest work being on the organisms and trade pathway. So I'm going to pass it over to Jenna to take us through this afternoon, and I will see you guys back at the break. Thanks so much, Mackenzie, um, and we'll just get right into everything. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on day one in the afternoon session of the 2023 uh, Invasive Species Forum. My name is Jenna White, uh, and I'm a Program Development Coordinator, as Mackenzie mentioned, um, for the Invasive Species Centre. And I'm joining you today from my home in Sudbury, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Atikamekshing uh, Anishinaabek. And we had a blizzard here this morning, I thought I would uh, mention. It's it's pretty cold here, and I know we have some people joining down south, so a little bit jealous of that, but uh, it's any day is a good day to talk about invasive species, so really happy to be here. And before we begin, I also wanted to um, just mention, you know, a big thank you to Mackenzie and our other uh, staff who are working uh, on getting this forum all put together. It's, it's really great to be um, together today talking about such an important topic. Um, so in terms of logistics uh, for this presentation, um, for any of the presentations that are going to be taking place, please use the Q&A function if you have any questions. Uh, the speakers will be given 20 minutes to talk and, and hopefully they've got some time to answer any of your questions uh, that you may have uh, from that function. And if you're following on the live stream, uh, just you can put them in the chat there and we can uh, make sure that they get to, to the speakers. Um, and without any further delay, um, I will introduce our first speaker for this session, uh, which is on aquatic invasive species uh, developments in research and management. And our first speaker is Naomi Shepard from McGill University, uh, talking about the trophic impacts of invasive alien crayfishes under climate warming. So I will pass uh, it to you, Naomi. I was muted. <laughs> um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, more likely. Uh, my name is Naomi Shepard. I uh, just recently finished my master's thesis with uh, Professor Ricciardi in at McGill University. And today I wanted to talk to you about the second chapter of my thesis on the complex trophic impacts of invasive alien crayfishes in the future under climate warming. So for the purpose of my thesis or for this project, I looked at two different species of crayfish uh, within the genus of Procamberis. So the first one is Procamberis virginalis, or the marbled crayfish. It has no known native range. It was discovered quite recently in the aquatic pet trade. It's a triploid version of a haploid crayfish from Florida. It's a recent global invader. It's got an invasive range in Madagascar, in Japan, and has actually quite recently in the past two or three years has been exploding in Europe in terms of uh, different reports coming back. Uh, unfortunately, there's very little information of its field impacts because it's such a recent invader. We kind of know what it eats, but we don't really know what impacts it has in its invasive ranges. And the main cause of concern for this species is that it's parthenogenetic. So it's self-cloning. So unfortunately, if you have one, one individual in your environment, you're very likely to very soon have a whole population. And then the other species that I worked on was the Procamberis clarkii, or the red song crayfish. It's native to the southern United States. It's quite popular in Louisiana and around there. Um, it's a well-established global invader. It has an invasive range that spans the whole globe, other than pretty much Antarctica and Australia. It has very well-known impacts. It's a high-impact invader. It's a carrier for the crayfish plague, which was a problem in Europe. Um, and it's already invaded the Great Lakes. So it's actually already in the southern part of Lake Michigan. 
And so it's very likely to just keep establishing further north as climates as the climate warms. And these crayfish, like many other crayfish, have a wide variety of different impacts on a range of different organisms, such as fish, amphibians, gastropods, macrophytes, and even some submerged crops. And this can have some important ramifications on industry and local economies, because a reduction in fish populations is likely to have a reduction in fishery yields, a reduction in macrophytes is likely to change stable states of a clear macrophyte dominant lake to a turbid uh, algae dominant lake. And if they have impacts on submerged crops, then that can also have impacts on agriculture, especially considering uh, there are already some reports of, of uh, red, uh, red swamp crayfish consumption of uh, rice in, in the third world country. This could be in third world countries, this could be an issue. And so all of these impacts are rela uh, related directly to the, consume, the, the, the consumption of these species on these organisms. And so if we can try to measure consumption rates, then we can probably measure, or we can measure, uh, or try to predict field impacts in, in, uh, in the environments that they invade. And the way that we do this is through the use of functional responses. So functional responses are the rate of a resource's consumption in relation to that resource's density. So by giving a variety of different densities of a prey population, for example, and then counting how many of those preys gets eaten by the invader or by the organism, we can try to understand how much they're consuming. Uh, we can try to measure that, that consumption rate. And functional responses come in three forms. The type one is a clear filter feeding organism. For every prey, for every prey individual that you give it, it it's going gonna, it's gonna to consume and it's going to prey upon that prey individual. The type two response is a uh, log a logarithmic curve. It asymptotes at some point when the when the uh, predator gets satiated, but at low densities, the predator is still eating the majority of the prey. The predator is eating the majority of the prey individuals. And then we have a type three curve, which is an S-shaped curve. We still see that asymptote at the high densities, but at the low densities, we also see a reduction in feeding, because when prey populations get smaller, the predator finds it harder to to find the prey. And so what this means is that the prey has an, an, an environment in which when the densities get really low, it has the ability to bounce back because it, the predation gets, uh, gets lowered as well. And so we usually see a type three response as a stabilizing response because the prey can uh, be reduced and then bounce back, whereas a type two response is seen as a destabilizing response because no matter what happens, the prey is gonna get uh, preyed upon. And what's Quite kind of neat about functional responses and the beauty of them is that because they're relative, if we if we measure functional responses for two different species, we can actually compare the two to understand which ones which one has a worse impact than the other. So this is usually done with a native and an invader, where the native is assumed to be the baseline amount of consumption that the prey population uh, has to go through, and so then if the invader is higher than that, then the then it'll have a higher impact on the prey population. But this can also be used in terms of my case where we use two different invaders to try and understand which one might have a greater impact on a prey population than the other. And the beauty of this is that they can also be uh, curated to environmental contexts of our choosing and of, of interest. And so with climate change in the Great Lakes, temperature is gonna be something that changes quite dramatically. And so we can actually have temperature mediated comparative, comparative functions, comparative functional responses, sorry. And with the underlying assumption that the closer that an organism is to its environmental optimum, the higher its impact are going to be. And so if we look at the Great Lakes, for example, we can pick two temperatures, which I did. I picked 18 degrees, which is the current average water temperature in the Great Lakes, and 26. And 26 I picked for three reasons. The first one is that it's within the realm of possibilities of what some of the environment, like what some of the Great Lakes will experience. It's not an average by any means, but it is within uh, what could possibly be experienced in some places in the Great Lakes. It's also, because it's a little bit higher than the average, it's more likely to show differences in functional responses. And because it's also been used in lab previously in the past, by we can actually back compare my, my data to data previously measured in the, in the lab to try to understand uh, to be able to compare like multiple species without without having to spend um, well without having me having to spend a lot more time in my masters on something um, something else. But yeah, so to run a functional response experiment, it's pretty simple. Uh, you get a bunch of different densities. You put your predator in, so the crayfish, into a tank. 
and then you give it one of those densities. So I had seven densities of bloodworms. I waited three hours. I came back. I took the crayfish out, and I counted what was left, and I graphed that. And so th that gives me that gives me four graphs, one for each each uh, species at each temperature that I can then compare to each other. So on the left we have uh, the species compared by temperature, and on the right we have the species compared to to each other um, in respect to species. And so at 18 degrees, what we find is that red swamps have a significantly higher attack rate. So at low densities, they're eating more, and they have a significantly higher maximum feeding rate. So again, at high densities, they're also eating more. And so red swamps are clearly dominating over marble crayfish in terms of consumption at 18 degrees of bloodworms. At 26 below, we see that they again have a higher maximum feeding rate, but the attack rate is actually higher for the marble crayfish. And so the marble crayfish are a little bit better at attacking um, bloodworms at 26 degrees. When we look at marble crayfish at 18 and 26, we see that the attack rate of marble crayfish at 26 degrees is higher than at 18 degrees, but the maximum feeding rate, so the, the, the maximum amount that they can eat, is higher for 18 degrees. We can't really see it on my graph because unfortunately I didn't have the foresight to add another density at the end, a 300 density for, um, for marble crayfish, but we don't actually see the asymptote if you look closely, we don't actually see the asymptote of 18 degrees, whereas we do see the asymptote for 26. So if we're, we were to have a higher density for that particular experiment, we would actually see that the green curve would go up above the orange one. And then for red swamps, we find that uh, there's a higher attack rate of at 18 degrees, but the maximum feeding rate remains the same at both temperatures. But then once I did that, I realized, well, that's all well and good, but Red crayfish are omnivorous consumers. They eat plants just as much as they um, uh, prey, like um, uh, animal prey. And so it'd be interesting to see if we can try to measure their consumption rate of macrophytes. And so that's what I did. I did the same thing as I did with bloodworms, but instead of having seven densities of bloodworms, I had seven densities of macrophyte segments. So they were about five centimeters long, all measuring about five milligrams more or less. And I gave them uh, seven densities of those segments. And so I measured the weight at the start and the weight at the end. So instead of measuring whether or not the segment itself is consumed, I actually measured just the weight that was consumed. And so what that leads us to is these graphs. And so at 18 degrees, once again, marble cray uh, red swan crayfish eat a lot more than marble crayfish. Um, they have a much higher maximum feeding rate and uh, an attack rate at 26 degrees they have a higher maximum feeding rate but there's no there's an and a higher attack rate as well and then when we compare marble crayfish to uh, marble crayfish to each other we see no difference in attack rates and no difference in maximum feeding rates so they're just as interested they in theory seem to be just as interested in mal in in uh, macrophyte segments as at, at either temperature and when we compare red swan crayfish we see that at 18 degrees, it has a higher attack rate, but the actual maximum feeding rate doesn't change, doesn't differ significantly. Now, the difference between, the main difference between these two experiments that I found is that when I gave my uh, red swan crayfish, oh, any, any crayfish, macrophytes, sometimes they just refuse to eat. So we'd have, I'd have a bunch of experiments where my consumption was just a, a zero. And instead of just getting rid of those, like a lot of functional responses will do because they're trying to measure um, consumption, I actually tried to, I, I did a logistic uh, regression analysis to try and understand if, if the propensity to feed on these macrophyte segments is actually impacted by temperature. And what I found is that even though marble crayfish don't differ in attack rate or handling time, at 26 degrees, they were more likely to, to feed just in like as a binary response, like just to feed even a little bit. Whereas the red swamps, the red swamp crayfish had the same amount of uh, maximum feeding rates, no difference, and they also have the same propensity to feed at both temperatures. And so even though at the top it looks like there's no difference, there actually is when you look at propensity to feed on macrophytes. And so the main takeaway of my project was that red swamps are important consumers. They outperform marble crayfish at either resource at either temperature. They also have no difference in consumption across temperature ranges, which is huge. Um, that's usually quite unlikely. And in fact, it kind of contradicts the environmental matching hypothesis that I was talking about before, where they don't seem to have an optima. Now, this could just be the fact that my two temperatures 
wasn't able like we, with my two temperatures i wasn't able to, me to actually measure where the optimum would be or getting closer to it or further away from it maybe i just like pinpointed it put perfectly where i couldn't see anything um but also we see that there's a reduction in macrophyte consumption a little bit at higher temperatures um based on attack rate and this does contradict previous experiments where they found that red swamp crayfish particularly at higher temperatures eat more macrophytes to try and offset the higher energetic demands of a higher temperature um, and i found the complete opposite and so pretty much what i the, the reason that the, the way that i explain this is that um in the other experiments they had crayfish at 26 degrees for um heat waves so like a couple of days and that's about it Whereas for me, my crayfish were at 26 degrees for a few months. And so the very fact that they were at 26 degrees for a few months means that they probably were able to compensate uh, for the higher metabolic costs of uh, the higher uh, temperature. And so the main takeaway is, is that red swamps are more like are going to be more likely to be a, a greater risk for the Great Lakes in the future, as well as in the present. Um, and at least, at least from a purely consumption point of view. Um, but though we do have to keep in mind the fact that marble crayfish have just this higher ability, reproductive ability. And so if we were to take further steps, we should try to include uh, this reproductive ability in our risk assessment. And so with that, I would like to uh, thank my supervisor, uh, Professor Anthony Ricciardi at the Red Park Museum at McGill, my undergraduate research assistants, Jesse and Jennifer Pham, uh, DFO for the funding and the institutions that I, that I work at. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Naomi. That was really, really fascinating work that you're doing and uh, really great to see um, some of those updates. So thank you so much for that. Um, we'll give a few minutes uh, for any questions uh, that might come in. Um, so just remember to use the uh, the chat or sorry, the, the question uh, function there. Um, nice little fancy function. Uh, if you have anything to ask, um, if you don't have anything that comes to mind right away, um, no worries, we can uh, try to moderate that uh, chat function uh, throughout the presentations. So uh, feel free to put it in at any time. Um, in the meantime, Naomi, I, I was wondering if you wanted to speak maybe to the introduction of those two uh, types of crayfish and how they're introduced into those areas. Yeah, so um, specifically for the Great Lakes, at least definitely for the marble crayfish, it's going to be a, a pet trade pathway. Um, okay. Uh yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, they're, they're now illegal in, in Ontario. In fact, it, it, it was like right bang in the middle of when I was trying to get more. So that was a bit of a, a problem for me in my, in my thesis, but yeah, so they're now illegal in Ontario. And we pretty much think that because, because they reproduce, so you buy one organism and you get, you get, you buy one crayfish and you get really excited about your one crayfish. And suddenly, as I've experienced, cause I'm, I'm drowning in crayfish babies, you suddenly have a hundred babies and you don't know what to do with them. And a lot of people don't want to kill them or they don't want to give them up. And so I've actually talked to a lot of aquarium uh, hobbyists or even just people who own pet stores and they, they say that they get a lot back and it's just because people don't know what to do with them because they've got so many. Um, and the red swamp crayfish, it could be that as well. It could also just be the fact that sometimes it's, it's, it's a, it's, um, it's turn, like it's for food, like a, like a red swamp crayfish is consumed a much more than the marble crayfish, but the red swamp crayfish comes in a lot of beautiful colors. Um, so it could also just be a pet pathway as well. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, and uh, we actually did have a couple of questions come in. So we have two minutes uh, to go through those. Um, so uh, somebody said, thank you. Great talk. And any other management considerations uh, coming out of the work? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of my management considerations um, is more just in terms of prevention. So the way that we kind of see that, like in, in our lab, the idea is that if we can if we can assess risk, we can inform prevention. And it's a lot less costly to, to prevent something than to try and fix it. Um, but I think a lot of it is more just in terms of trying to understand instead of, it's, it's not really so much about management so much as trying to understand risk and, and that then leading to better management decisions. And I think the main takeaway from my, from my thesis, for me at least, was we need to include different types of resources when we try to do these risk assessments. Because a lot of the time, you know, we're using bloodworms, we're using prey animals, and we're not actually looking at the huge impacts of macrophyte consumption by these species. Absolutely. Yeah, the preventative piece is really is really key, uh, especially in invasive species context. So thank you for that. Um, and just one more question. Um, what species uh, of plants did you use to feed the crayfishes in the experiment? 
Yeah, so I use Eurasian water mill foil, which is also an invasive species because it was very easy to get. Pretty much every urban pond in Montreal has some. <laughs> and so in a pandemic, when getting macrophytes was not always like, like field work was not always an, an option, having a place that I could really just walk down the street and pick some up was pretty useful. No kidding, that's uh, that's really interesting stuff. Yeah, um, there is one more question actually, um, and maybe we can touch on it really quickly. Um, how did you import uh, the crayfish? Yeah, so the the thing is because I, I, I started my master's thesis as the lockdowns hit, so I really didn't have any, I, I would have loved to have gone to the United States to collect some some uh, some wild crayfish, but all of the, the two crayfish species that I used are actually at the time were very common in pet trade, in the pet trade um, um, kind of area. So I was able to just buy them online off uh, off some sellers. So I got something like 60 marbled crayfish from online, just to give you the, an idea of like how easy it is to, to get these these animals. Um, and the red swamps as well came from came from a, a seller online. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a, a little bit alarming, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Naomi. Really, really appreciate your chat today. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Jessica Goldsmith of uh, the Quebec government in the Ministère des Forêts um, to provide an update on the distribution challenges and management techniques uh, of fish and invertebrates, uh, sorry, of invasive species in Quebec. I'll talk off to you. Thanks so much. Hi. Yeah, do you hear me? Sounds great. Yep. Good. You see my screen? I I do. Yep. You're you're all okay. good to go. Okay. Um shared mode. Yeah. Awesome. Uh thank you. Yeah. So um yes, uh, I'm uh, Jessica Goldsmith. I um a bi biologist uh, working for the aquatic invasive species uh, team in the Minister of uh, Environment in, in Quebec and I uh, will talk to you about uh, zebra mussel and the situation here in Quebec and uh, initially, it was uh, the, the talk uh, was to make emphasis on the recently invaded uh, Temiscuata Lake uh, in eastern Quebec, but I will just uh, give a more general view about inland lakes uh, in south and eastern Quebec. So uh, just uh, to, to know and have in mind uh, what is the zebra mussel uh, distribution uh, known in North America, you can see that uh, it is uh, more uh, in the center and east of uh, US and now um, in Quebec. And specifically for uh, the distribution in Quebec, uh, uh, the, it has been uh, present in the St. Lawrence and in the Richelieu River since uh, 1990. Uh, we also have uh, quagga mussels, but only in the St. Lawrence. So they have been there for a while, but then just uh, recently, uh, since uh, 2017, uh, the zebra mussels uh, were uh, observed in uh, Lake uh, Menfermagog, that is in this uh, region, uh, that is uh, uh, a region in uh, Quebec that is called Estri. So uh, it has been uh, found there and then uh, eventually like moving to different uh, lakes uh, since then. And then uh, just uh, last year in, in September 2022, it was uh, first observed in uh, Temiscuata Lake. That is, uh, as you see, like very far, uh, very far east uh, in Quebec and uh, just uh, to have a... Um, uh, uh, dimension of uh, how from here to here there are more much more than 300 uh, kilometers so it's uh, really like uh, it has been uh, taken far so um, as you may know uh, calcium levels are an important uh, uh, component in the environment uh, for the zebra mussels to survive growth and reproduce and these are just uh, some graphs uh, that I took from the literature uh, just to show you uh, how the calcium levels affect um, the, the, these uh, three main functions uh, for uh, zebra mussels. So uh, in here we have the, the mortality and then the pH and calcium. And we see that uh, in here around 20 milligrams uh, per liter and a pH of around eight, there is no mortality at all. So these are the, the, environment, uh, the, the environmental conditions that uh, zebra mussels, they, they like. 
Uh, also, they like uh, uh, calcium to um, uh, to grow. So uh, in this um, graph, we can see the, the growth and the calcium levels and everything that is um, uh, between 15 and 18 uh, milligrams per liter. It, ju it just shows that uh, it, it, it's very good for growth. Uh, for these organisms and also for reproduction. So we have a, in this graph a larval production and then also calcium. And then we see at here that uh, even at uh, 12 milligrams per liter, even if it's, if it's minimal, there is already some larval production. So we know that this um, is, is important uh, for them to to survive and, and grow and reproduce. So the next step uh, was to uh, see uh, what are the, um, the calcium levels in the, the, the lakes uh, in, in the province of Quebec. So uh, this is a, a map uh, where we can see all the, the points uh, from uh, where the warmer, uh, warmer colors, they show higher um, concentrations of, cal of calcium. So you can see that they are mainly distributed in this region, a little bit here and here. And then this region in particular, they're very high in calcium levels. And this is explained by geology because uh, there is a, um, this a geological province that is uh, rich, in rich in limestone and that is called the Appalach. Uh, so all this region, it, it, re it is really high because the sediments are rich uh, in, in calcium levels. Uh, so we did an interpolation of known calcium levels uh, just to see the general distribution of uh, this. And with this map, we can actually see the, and, and identify which are the vulnerable areas. Uh, so we can see like uh, ABTV and um, here the Laurentides and uh, Otawe that they're very, um, they're vulnerable areas. The, the zebra mussels are not, not there, but uh, it's good to keep an eye on that. Uh, but then uh, these two main regions where it recently uh, we have found uh, uh, and observed uh, uh, zebra mussels uh, getting there and expanding the range, they can just uh, find a suitable habitat uh, uh, regarding calcium. So uh, just a zoom up uh, to see that uh, this region, uh, here is the, the lake, Temiscuata Lake, uh, the, where it, it was found uh, um, last year. And we can see that there is a, a gradient uh, in, uh, in calcium levels. So all these uh, regions are, can, can be considered at uh, very high risk. Uh, so just a, um, a summary of uh, the impacts uh, and the influence uh, uh, of uh, zebra mussels in the trophic well. So we know that these mussels are experts in filtering water and they can uh, filter up to one liter of water per day. They can get to really high densities, uh, uh, up to 20,000 individuals per square meter. So when water is more clear, then the light gets uh, deeper and can contribute to warmer waters. And then the aquatic plants uh, can get uh, deeper and then the thermocline uh, gets deeper also. And then all these uh, make changes uh, in the structure and the zooplankton decreases and there is a cascading effect uh, with all dependent species. So these changes in the trophic web and the habitat uh, may favor a species asso associated to plants such as a uh, yellow perch, for example, or that may, her may harm others such as uh, um, salmonids that uh, if they are distributed in the, the same regions, uh, all, all the, 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 the trophic web uh, can change and affect them. So going specifically to um, this uh, region uh, in Quebec, the south region in, in Estrie, uh, the, the, this is the situation in Menfermagog and Magog Lakes. Uh, so uh, I just won't go into any detail on this table. Just I uh, want to show you that uh, we have been doing um, monitoring in this region uh, since um, uh, it has been discovered there. And uh, one like uh, something to, to highlight is uh, like, for example, this uh, station where uh, in 2019, there were four individuals per meter square. And then just a couple of years later, 2022, 
the, the density gets uh, are, um, at uh, 6,700 individuals per meter square. So it is recent, it is increasing uh, a, a lot. They are surviving, they are uh, reproducing uh, and growing. And then uh, something um, that uh, really strikes uh, and to highlight also is that the calcium levels, uh, they're not that high in this region. They are around 18 and, and 20 milligrams per liter. So even at this uh, um, medium levels, the conditions uh, work uh, very well for them to uh, complete their cycle. Um, so there's a, another lake, uh, the Masawipi Lake, uh, that was uh, first mentioned in October 2021. Um, and then uh, in November uh, 2021, there was a, a field uh, um, a campaign that was uh, organized uh, to go and see um, uh, what was the, the situation. And this is uh, uh, what uh, we, it was found in, in the lake, that uh, in here we see the, the stars, uh, that's uh, where the, the adults were present and then um, there were um, like uh, juveniles uh, not all over the lake but they're concentrated in the uh, center and uh, northern uh, portions of the, the lake. Um, so if uh, we can we can see what is the, the structure the, the, of the population, this is the number of uh, individuals uh, up to 40 individuals. Um, well, no, um, yeah, this is uh, the number of individuals uh, and um, the size. And we can see that uh, most of them, they are between five and 10 uh, millimeters and then just uh, a, a few um, adults as well. Uh, and uh, not that dense, uh, not, not, not a lot of density in, in one cent in the same place. This is the cumulative number of individuals, individuals that were collected. Uh, and just uh, to follow up uh, with this, uh, um, stages, different stages of uh, the invasion and the situation in Temiscuata Lake uh, that is here more to the eastern, northeastern part of uh, Quebec. The first mention uh, was done uh, in September 2022 by a citizen. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, just uh, right away we tried to um, uh, go to the field and assess the situation. So there were quadrats uh, that were uh, deployed uh, in uh, while diving up to maximum five meters and then snorkeling uh, just uh, cl close to, to the shore. Uh, so we actually uh, found that uh, uh, like all of the lake uh, was... Um, uh, already had a presence uh, of um, uh, zebra mussels and uh, the, the structure, the size uh, the, and, and the numbers uh, were uh, a lot. So we can see um, in here that uh, at 16 stations and 18 stations, we found around uh, um, 2,600 uh, closer to the shore and then uh, 900 up to a thousand of individuals uh, and deeper. And then we see that uh, um, they are um, very high densities also, like uh, 300 and then 700, uh, uh, well, up to 600 individuals uh, of one same size. Um, and then if we compare it to the Lake uh, Masawipi that was uh, more to the south, um, uh, we, we can see that uh, there is a, um, a very longer time um, we, we, we think that there is a longer time since they have been there and they were unnoticed since uh, we see that there are very uh, a lot of young uh, and, and juveniles. And this also can be um, explained uh, by a delayed recruitment, given that uh, it's colder uh, in there. And, um, um, and how does this uh, affect the survival rates? It's something that uh, we, we need to figure it out. But uh, we, we believe that th this invasion has been there. It has been recently found, but the, the, the pop population is already established uh, since a few years already. So this is not just a, a local um, uh, thing uh, to, to think uh, 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 problematic since, oops, uh, since uh, Quebec and this lake uh, uh, just... Uh, 
is connected with the Madawaska, Madawaska River to New Brunswick. And then uh, it, it also uh, later uh, it meets uh, St. John's uh, River. In, and so all this uh, it's connected and can affect uh, other um, jurisdictions. So I uh, didn't go into any details, but we also did some uh, tests uh, of different um, uh, methods to detect and monitoring. And then uh, what uh, we recommend at the end is that uh, snorkeling or diving with interaction with the substrate. So just uh, go and see um, if they're, they are attached or not uh, to, to rocks and vegetation. Um, it's uh, well, some, something good that we can also uh, say to uh, like recommend this uh, method uh, other than just uh, the aquascope, for example, or making D-nets or uh, sending uh, cameras uh, with uh, no, no anchor, for example. So this is uh, very important uh, uh, that we want to be more strict with prevention measures. So just uh, promote uh, clean, drain, dry, and then just communicate well the message to all citizens and, uh, and users. Um, because uh, uh, it, it's very important that they they, they get uh, the, 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 like the, the the situation and what's the, the, the problematic of this. So the actions uh, um, that are coming in 2023 and 2024 is uh, to continue monitoring in the field and uh, just not uh, samples uh, in, in the field, but also we will um, do some eDNA e test uh, uh, all around the, the, the region, try to um, to see if uh, the, the, they are already established in other uh, lakes, uh, near, lake, uh, near lakes. Also, um, identify lakes and regions at highest risk and increase uh, surveillance, uh, increase the awareness, so uh, also for citizens and municipalities, and then communicate, uh, um, make a higher effort uh, uh, with in communication products, uh, just uh, with brochures, for example, and then uh, making uh, traffic signs uh, uh, on the road uh, that uh, we, we can also put to um, uh, inform people that they are entering uh, in a zebra mussel uh, region, for example. Uh, as I said, uh, encourage uh, the clean, drain, dry, increase availability of washing stations. We have a funding program for municipalities uh, to build the uh, washing stations. And then uh, we're uh, one of the projects uh, uh, th this year is uh, um, to to see if we can change uh, the legislation. Some uh, some things uh, uh, like uh, make it mandatory to remove the drain plug uh, while trailing, for example, and then the removal of all weeds and organisms, uh, just uh, as um, um, Ontario recently did. Uh, so we want to to explore the possibility of uh, making these changes into our legislation. Yeah. So uh, the last slide is um, some uh, research projects uh, that we will be participating. Also, it's uh, and to with the collaboration with uh, McGill University in a master thesis is to uh, evaluate the zero muscle impact in Benthic community and tropic web in Memphremargo Lake. And then um, keep continuing uh, uh, in a long-term monetary study uh, of the benthic and zooplankton communities in the Massawippi Lake. So uh, make a link uh, with the muscle density with this. And this is a collaboration uh, with the Blue Massawippi. And then, uh, of course, uh, collect uh, more data to understand uh, what is um, the situation in the, uh, of the population of uh, Temiscuata Lake and uh, to see if uh, this uh, the, there is this uh, delay recruitment uh, due to a colder uh, location. So how all this uh, uh, it's um, linked uh, with the survival rates. Uh, so with this, I just uh, thank you. And uh, I think uh, we're okay with the time. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I think one of the other speakers referred to zebra mussels as the poster child of invasive species, and I think that really <laughs> is probably a true statement in this context. Um, we have uh, three questions that uh, hopefully, sorry, I guess four, hoping we can get through in the next uh, two minutes or so. Okay. Um, so. The first one is, what is the lowest calcium level for the mussels to become established? Yeah, so um, uh, as uh, we saw, according to the literature, uh, it is uh, like lower levels of around 12 um, 
it won't uh, work for all this uh, um, the, the, the metabolism that, that they need uh, for survival, growth, and reproduction. Um, and uh, we will set like a uh, different uh, type of uh, thresholds uh, just to type measure the the the, the risk of a, a, a lake, for example, uh, according to the the calcium levels. Um, but uh, yeah, as uh, we saw, like uh, very high, we could consider like uh, up to from 25 milligrams per liter. But as I, as I showed, like uh, in regions where there is 18, 20, they already like they like it and they're there yeah yeah that's uh yeah yikes <laughs> thanks for thanks for that um so i uh, just next question is on uh which predictor variables influence the expansion of zebra mussels which predictor variables well calcium is one that, that we're um like uh, looking very closely then ph and then of course uh, uh that's uh, then the, the the temperature right uh, uh and then uh, the well it's not the case uh, in uh, in inland lakes but uh, more to like in the the, the St. Lawrence for example they will stop uh, where the salinity gets uh, high uh, and not suitable for them Great, thank you. Um, and just two more quickly. Um, so based on the sizes found in both lakes, how long do you think um, that it's been since they were first introduced? introduced? Um, and it, it's, uh, this person says looks uh, like quite recently, probably in the last couple of years. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. so in Temiscuata, uh, then the one that we were aware of uh, their presence uh, in September, 2022. And um, yeah, it, it's been there we think uh, we believe two or three years, uh, but it, it got uh, unnoticed. But now it's like uh, it, it was distributed all over the the, the lake, as uh, we show. So we think that uh, there might be a, a high probability of uh, other lakes uh, around, uh, like they are already. So we're trying to work uh, with a. Uh, the, the community um, and the municipalities and all that uh, to um, for the people to be aware and just uh, uh, inform if they if they see it. There's a good collaboration with everybody. Absolutely. Now that's, that's interest. Good yeah, absolutely. Um, and and just our last question is on uh, policy tools. Um, and if we if Quebec currently has any policy tools or regulations uh, that are used to help. Um, you know, with this, with this. Yeah, so the clean drain dry, it is highly um, suggested. Uh, it's not mandatory, but uh, uh, as we said, uh, uh, regarding to um, the, the, the measures that we could take and we can um, maybe change, uh, there is this... Uh, and take, uh, re like remove the the, the plug uh, well, for the trail so all the the water is drained and um just uh, inspect uh, the, that uh, everything uh that it, that it doesn't have any organisms attached but uh yeah i would go more for the remove uh, the, the clean drain dry that is highly uh, suggested <laughs> yes yes thank you so much jessica we really really appreciate uh, your talk today thank you so much and thanks for answering those questions. Uh, so, so um, yeah, um, great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So we'll we'll move along to our uh, our next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Jordana uh, Bergman of Carleton University, um, and she's going to be presenting on an interdisciplinary uh, evaluation of multi-species fish connectivity in Canada's historic Rideau Canal, which I hope is uh, up and running for skating at this time of year. <laughs> uh. Yeah. The weather's been so bizarre that um, it still has not, and my computer has frozen, so just, oh, oh no. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. If I can get this to share. Of course it does the... We can, uh, we can give it a minute here and, uh, you know, maybe uh, switch things around if we need to, and, and I can always share it on my end uh, in a few minutes. It looks like it's thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, this main screen, not the um, the like share screen slide, right? Perfect. We can see you. Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Thanks. So um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordana Bergman. 
I am a PhD candidate at Carleton University in Ottawa, where I am working under the supervision of Dr. Stephen Cook and Joseph Bennett. And I'm going to be sharing with you today one of my dissertation chapters that's focusing on invasive and native fish connectivity in Canada's historic Rideau Canal. I want to first go ahead and acknowledge that this is one of those projects that took an absolute village. So, um, you know, it might have been me that was out there leading the fieldwork and leading the analysis and the writing and everything. But I've had loads and loads of help from our collaborators um, Parks Canada. And we have engineers, the lockmasters have helped. So I just want to first go ahead and thank um, everyone that's helped with this. Um, I don't think I need to tell most of you that we are currently in this massive biodiversity decline. <clears throat> but some of you may not know that the biodiversity declines that are going on in our freshwater ecosystems are happening at a far faster rate compared to marine and terrestrial. Uh, we've lost since 1970 84% uh, of our freshwater populations. So this is a huge amount of biodiversity that we've lost. Um, and this uh, graph that was generated by Tickner et al. kind of shows you that it's not one specific taxa that's threatened every species freshwater and freshwater dependent are being threatened about a third of freshwater fishes are currently threatened with extinction um now it'll differ somewhat by continent and this uh, figure that i've pulled is a little bit outdated now but um generally the extinction rates that we're seeing in north america are generally driven even now in 2023 by loss of habitat and also by the introduction of non-indigenous or um, invasive species um, connectivity loss is also a massive, massive problem, and this is probably one of the driving issues for most species worldwide. And you'll notice in North America, um, you know, you see a lot of red. So a lot of our waterways, our river systems are really heavily fragmented. And, <clears throat> and unfortunately, in artificial waterways, like canals, uh, you have this simultaneous challenge of having to manage connectivity for native species, while also selectively managing um, to prevent the movement and dispersal of invasive species. And I just want to mention that there's about 620,000 kilometers of artificial waterways worldwide. So the work that we are doing here in the canal, you know, we're hoping it's going to be globally useful. And um, so if you're not familiar with the Rideau Canal Waterway, this is the system that I'm working in. Uh, it's located in eastern Ontario, Canada. It's 202, kilometer long, uh, 202 kilometers long, and it connects uh, Lake Ontario and the Ottawa River in Canada's capital of Ottawa. Um, so this was um, the Rideau Canal was constructed um, on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, who has stewarded this land since time immemorial. In 1832, Colonel John By of the Royal British Engineers came in, and they decided they were going to entirely connect two disconnected watersheds um, and create this waterway as an alternate route to the St. Lawrence River. Now, the Rideau Canal is interconnected by 23 operating lock stations. And on this map on the right, that's each of these tiny little red um, boxes. The red star just indicates the high point of the waterway. So the water flows downstream from there. Um, now, we know that there are migratory species within the Rideau Canal that conduct, you know, a totally freshwater migration to carry out their life history. But we're not sure if these fish uh, might be hitting a lock station in an attempt to move upstream or downstream, and they're not able to do so. We get loads of reports from lock masters and anglers that they see fish in locks or near locks, but nobody knows uh, to what extent fish can move throughout the system. Um, and this kind of goes against you know, connecting two different watersheds would mean increased connectivity uh, for native species, which usually we think is a good thing from a conservation perspective. Um, however, we don't know if they're fragmenting the system, so it may be, you know, impeding our migratory freshwater fish. However, um, these lock stations may act as an opportunity for us to intentionally fragment the system and prevent the further dispersal or introduction of new invasive species. Um, so especially like in Lake Ontario, I'm thinking about Asian carps, if they happen to make it in there, perhaps we could use um, a lock station as a way to prevent their entry. Uh, this is known as selective fragmentation, where what you want to do is both prevent the movement of invasive fishes while simultaneously allowing the movement or connectivity to native fishes. So you're selectively fragmenting habitat. And this is an evidence-based management strategy. So to develop a strategy like this, the first thing we have to do is figure out where and when fish are moving and if there's any species-specific movements. 
Um, so we have common carp that have proliferated throughout the system. They've been there for a long time. Um, we acoustically tagged 54 of them. Uh, for those of you not familiar with common carp, these have been listed as 100 of the world's worst invasive alien species. Um, and that is because they have these destructive reproductive and foraging capabilities and they can um, you know, really heavily alter the water quality in systems. Uh, generally not, not good to have in systems. Um, we also acoustically tagged two native species, northern pike and largemouth bass. And we selected those two species because northern pike are kind of the movers and shakers in the system. Uh, they are migratory and they move around quite a bit. Largemouth bass are generally known to kind of hunker down. They don't move quite as much, so it makes for a nice comparison. And all three species have very similar habitat requirements, so they all rely on vegetation. Um, we acoustically tagged 225 with these size-specific acoustic tags you see in the upper left-hand picture. Uh, the bigger ones only went into our large fish and the smaller ones went into our smaller fish. And I just want to mention, we also picture, picked these two recreational species um, because they are, they do generate uh, money for the economy. So they're economically important as well as ecologically important. Uh, so we tracked fish movements across three full navigation seasons to give us a good idea and replicate the data across different years. Uh, over 60 kilometers of the waterway that kind of act as a representation of the full um, Rideau Canal. I would have loved to track fish through the whole 200 kilometers, but unfortunately there's only one of me uh, and it just was too much to take on. And we monitored seven lock stations and that includes um, an electrically operated lock station. So most locks on the Rideau Canal are manually operated. And we also included a lock station that has two locks in flight to see if you know perhaps a double lock acts as more of a barrier. Uh, so each one of these blue dots you see on the map is an acoustic receiver that I would hop in the water and dive for to go retrieve and service and then redeploy. The yellow stars are our lock stations that were monitored for connectivity and the red star is a bridge which isn't technically a barrier because fish can pass underneath, but it acts as a divider between two different lakes. We focus mostly on lock connectivity because A, there's not a whole lot known about it in smaller historic canals like this. Um, and also fish can't move against, um, most of our dams are too high in the system for fish to jump. Um, but whenever we could, we also looked at interactions with infrastructure like locks and dams. So just to give you an idea, uh, this is a single chamber lock here. The yellow stars would be an acoustic receiver. So we always had one downstream and one upstream. But whenever we could, we would also deploy them you know, throughout the area so that we not only could see if a fish moved through a lock, but maybe they hang out in the lock channel. Uh, you know, do they hang out at the entrances? If there's a divergence, when do they, you know, do they select to go to the bypass channel, um, which is this more, you know, windy natural Rito. Uh, river area. Um, and we wanted to see if fish were perhaps drawn to these higher flow areas near the dam. Um, in a hope that we could evaluate, you know, the mechanism of packet passage, not only documenting passages. So we had key questions. Um, a, do fish move through locks? We simply wanted to answer that question because nobody uh, quite knows. We wanted to know though, are they species specific? Might it be season specific? And are they direction specific? So to start with, uh, do fish move through locks? Yes. Uh, we documented about 9% of our acoustically tagged fish moving through locks. Um, and that was 31 passage events. So we had several fish that had this proclivity to move through locks several times. Um, and this was at six lock stations. So there was only one uh, station that was quite far from the rest of the system that didn't document any passage events. And just to give you an idea, this is what a passage, this is how we documented a passage event. So we have the lock chamber here, the dam is up here, and these are the acoustic receivers that were tracking fish movement. Uh, we had this northern pike here that was about 500 millimeters long, where it was detected downstream consistently. And then during the locking operation hours during the day, uh, it seems to have entered with a boat, and then it was detected exclusively upstream, where then it made its way to the next reach. So it's pretty simple um, to understand when the fish are moving. Um, species specific movements also, yes. So we found that our, our migratory northern pike conducted about three fourths of all passage events and largemouth, path, largemouth bass conducted the other uh, quarter. And we were really shocked that we documented no common carp passage events. But it seems that this species is drawn to these higher flow but impassable regions that I had mentioned earlier. So. Um, <clears throat> this is another one of our lock stations we monitored. So you have the lock here, 
And then there's actually two dams and, and this bypass channel gets really nice high flow. Uh, this is what our acoustic array looked like for this lock station. And it turns out common carp hung out a lot more in these um, high flow areas, but there's no way for them to move up these dams. Uh, and they didn't hang out quite as much. They were detected every now and then near the downstream approach, lock approach. And, and this is the only way that they could truly move upstream. So it seems like uh, the system may already be selectively fragmented where common carp don't often make it upstream as much. At least we didn't uh, document any. So that's not to say, obviously they made it through the system somehow, but it doesn't seem to happen very often. For season, um, just to give you an idea, over the three years that we monitored fish movements, the temperatures were all pretty similar. If you were in Ontario, you might remember 2019 had a pretty cold um, spring and then in 2020 it was a little bit warmer, but in general, the trends are all pretty similar. And we found that 60% of our passage events occurred in spring in both May and June, which does correspond with the spawning season for these species. So um, we think that that could be something that's driving, you know, increased movements, which could bring them closer to these, um, areas of passability, and then they move through the reach that way. We also wanted to know though, and this is a tough uh, relationship to tease out because temperature and lockages are very collinear. Um, when the temperature is warmer, that's when we have more people locking throughout the system, so we have more lockages. So it's something we're gonna have to analyze separately. Um, but interestingly, as of now, there's a minimal relationship. So, so far having more lockages doesn't appear to mean there's gonna be more opportunities to fish for fish to move throughout the system because most fish moved in May and June uh, and a few in September and October. And that's when the water temperatures were colder. So it may be that in these hot summer months, these fish are just too tired um, to make that movement. It's just time to hunker down, it's too warm. So it's something that we're working on teasing out now, but um, it's something that we're considering and it's really interesting. And we also wanted to look at the direction um, of these passage events. Uh, this is the beautiful 3D figure that was generated by um, our collaborators that are engineers at the University of Ottawa, Dr. Colin Rennie um, and Kate Nigel. And this is essentially what it looks like inside of a lock. So, you know, you have the upstream gates, you have the downstream gates, and then you also have these sluice valves that fish can move in and out of. Um, and they generated these models because um, this year we're going to be starting a project looking at 3D flows inside of a lock chamber and overlaying that with fish movement data to see if we can really understand um, the mechanism of movement through locks. And so far it does seem like the direction, um, there also is a clear pattern in the directions because most of our passages, passage events occurred in the downstream direction, uh, which immediately, um, you know, is jogging uh, this idea that I wonder if it's a hydraulic factor that's in training fish and pulling them into the lock and that, uh, you know, these movements may not be intentional, which would definitely go against our idea that fish were moving um, in association with spawning. So it's something that we're going to have to carefully tease out. But I do want to just mention that I created a model that looks at the fish that conducted a passage event and didn't and compared that to just a binomial, a simple yes or no. I compare that to, you know, the distance that they were released from a barrier, the water temperature, the size of the fish, you know, maybe the tag had some kind of a burden on the animal and then they were tired and got pulled in and there was no significance at all. It didn't even, it wasn't even close. So, um, so far it looks like there must be something else going on. The fish really purposely, you know, moved in downstream or they simply got too close to a lock and then ended up, you know, traveling in with a boat or being sucked in. So, it's an interesting aspect that we're looking into, and I'm excited and so privileged to have the opportunity to work with engineers. Um, <clears throat> but it will be important because if these passage events are unintentional, then uh, that's something that, you know, Parks Canada can know or, or may need to know um, if they're moving fish intentionally one way or the other. Uh, something else that we really are curious to look into, and I'm starting to get into this analysis now, but you'll notice that the number of lockages each year um, changes a bit. So it, in, um, in 2019, we had about 60,000 lockages. In 2020, there was quite a drop down to about 44,000 lockages in the system. It jumps right back up in 2021. You'll notice there might even be a little bit more because people were awfully eager to get back out. Um, and what happened in 2021, as most of you know, is the anthropause. So if you're not familiar with the anthropause, it essentially was this 
um, you know, massive lockdown globally that resulted in a lot less people out and about. So um, across different taxa, animals were reacting differently to reduced noise, reduced um, traffic, just there weren't human interactions. So we wanted to see perhaps if there were any changes in fish behavior. And potentially, yes. Uh, so we documented only seven passages in 2020 compared to 24 in 2019. And if we're looking at the number, the total number of fish that were being detected each year, it was a drop in about 5% of detected fish conducting passages in 2019 to 2020. So this isn't a huge amount. It may not be significant. It's something I need to, you know, run through a model to confirm and verify. And I also want to mention, unfortunately, we had very few fish being detected by the third year. Um, and we had to massively reduce our array because of funding constraints. So I can't compare 2021. Um, but it looks like as a result overall of less lockages um, and less operations in general being conducted, we may be seeing less connectivity in the system. Um, all right, so I think I'll start wrapping this up. Um, so we found that fish do move through locks, which is uh, was really was the key question that Parks Canada wanted to ask. And there's also a lot of um, previous research that suggests that fish, uh, that locks don't generate enough attractant for fish to, um, you know, even figure out where they, they are and then move upstream. So uh, we found the opposite. Fish do move through them. It's not super often, but it does happen. Um, most of the passage events were conducted by migratory northern pike, which makes sense uh, compared to largemouth bass. But we were really surprised about zero carp. Uh, and it turns out it's because carp are drawn to these impassable but higher flow um, areas. 60% um, did happen in the spring, which could indicate then reproductive movements, but most of them were in the downstream direction. So we need to carefully tease out if it's hydraulic factors uh, that might be in training fish. And then we also really are curious to look at the effects of the COVID-19 lockdown. I'd love to get my hands on discharge data too, so we can see if flows um, and actually model those flows. I want to um, briefly mention that we're going to have to very cons uh, carefully consider any conservation actions that we recommend to Parks Canada because there is another invasive fish in the Rideau Canal. Um, round goby were discovered only a few years ago and we got out there as fast as we could to acoustically tag and track these fish. Um, and it turns out goby can not navigate those lock chambers. Um, they're able to move upstream through the locks. We did only document one passage event, which is great. Um, but it does seem that they can also move upstream. So it's not only common carp that we have to think about using the locks for movement. We did find though with this study that if we can modify the infrastructure and behavior um, of how the lock masters manage um, these locks, then there may be opportunities to completely minimize their dispersal. Um, and I just wanna mention again, that there are historic canals and waterways worldwide. So if you're working somewhere else in the world, uh, or you ever want to chat about this and um, you know a lot of the work that we're doing we're hoping to set up to be applicable to any waterway or any canal. Um, I really appreciate um, being here and having the chance to speak with all of you and if you have any questions I might be happy to chat. Thanks so much Jordana that was really uh, fascinating work that you're doing um, so thank you so much for sharing. Uh, unfortunately we're actually out of time for questions but I'm hoping maybe you can monitor the chat and just see sure. if anything comes in. Okay. Um, it looks like we had one or two, so uh, if you okay, don't mind great. on there, but really appreciate your presentation. Thanks so much. For your Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll uh, move on to our last presentation for this session. Um, with me is um, Alan Chen of uh, Queen's University to present on the development and validation of the 12th loop uh, mediated isothermal amplification. Um, and so uh, just hoping uh, to pass it to you. Yeah, I think we're ready to go. Thanks, Jenna. Can you see my screen? Can see your screen. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Uh, today I'm presenting a novel emerging um, environmental DNA tool for the rapid and low cost detection of invasive species. Uh, this is the invasive species form, so I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about invasive species. But over the last 180 years, 200 years, um, over 180 non-native species have been introduced to the Great Lakes, uh, mainly due to the construction of um, uh, the Wayland Canal and increases in um, uh, shipping. Invasives are characterized by fast growth and reproduction, lack of natural predators and herbivores, and being generous pioneer, pioneer species. And um, they're second only to habitat loss as a threat to biodiversity. 
And um, so we thought about applying a point of care concept to environmental monitoring. Uh, point of care is a concept in healthcare where diagnostics are applied by the patient's bedside, which reduces turnaround time and allows rapid treatment. And this includes things like COVID tests, glucometers, and heart rate monitors. And ecological monitoring can capitalize on this concept and advances in this field um, for our own benefit. So we can collect a water sample and then do at field tests, including um, rapid amino assays for toxins, microfluidic nucleic acid detection for invasive species and water sensors. And this allows us to create a conservation plan quickly and do a rapid um, immediate assessment without uh, the turnaround time of a lab. So environmental DNA, um, organisms release genetic material as they interact with their environment in the form of sk uh, shed skin cells, hair, gametes, uh, feces into the air, soil, and water. And this doesn't require the direct capture of target organisms, except for microbes, of course. And um, when we collect an environmental DNA sample, we can use it for early detection of invasive species, surveying cryptic, rare, or at-risk species, and describing whole ecosystem tropic interactions. So collecting an EDA sample can be as simple as just collecting a water sample or a scoop of soil. And then through concentrating the DNA in that sample, uh, we can detect all species that have uh, shed their DNA into that. And it can be very sensitive and very time specific. Uh, eDNA tends to degrade in around three weeks, in, uh, but it's highly dependent on the environmental conditions. Um, so eDNA is generally analyzed in three ways. Uh, traditional PCR followed by a gel or Sanger sequencing, quantitative or di double droplet digital PCR or metabarcoding. Uh, traditional PCR involves species specific primers and then a way of um, detecting that product using a gel electrophoresis or Sanger sequencing. And then this is very low cost for both consumables and apparatus, but it's time consuming and can be limited in specificity. Uh, QPCR and droplet digital PCR also involves species specific primers and a fluorescent dye. Uh, and this allows us to quantify the amount of um, target DNA. And with the use of a probe, it can be highly sensitive. Uh, however, this again can be very expensive, especially in terms of apparatus. And then finally, metabarcoding involves non-specific primers followed by next-gen sequencing. And this produces um, operational taxonomic units, uh, which can be matched to specific taxa. And this allows us to detect many species at once. However, it's limited by databases. And again, it's very expensive, it requires significant lab work and bioinformatics expertise and very expensive apparatus. And none of these are suitable for analysis in the field. Um, all of these methods require extracted high purity genomic DNA they're influenced by PCR inhibition, which is very common in some environmental samples. Um, a lot of environmental DNA samples contain inhibitors such as proteins, uh, fulvic acid, humic acids. They, they require expensive and bulky apparatus and um, sometimes long processing times, making them unsuitable for immediate analysis in the field. And um, loop-mediated isothermal amplification is an emerging technology for amplifying DNA with high specificity under non-thermal cycling conditions. And it's been applied to great use for um, COVID testing, actually. I think uh, there's currently three approved COVID tests, which are LAMP-based. Uh, LAMP involves four primers, which recognizes six sequences on target DNA, and optional loop primers for highly specific amplification without a probe. So because it requires four to six primers, um, the amount of matching is much greater. It uses polymerase of high strand displacement activity. So essentially the polymerase itself displaces and denatures the DNA. Um, and this allows us to have isothermal amplification, which means no thermal cyclers needed. Um, this produces self-propagating reactions of a stem loop DNA structure. It's very rapid and the products can be quickly visualized with um, a pocket fluorometer or even just a pH changing dye. So as the reaction progresses, um, the pH changes. And there's already commercial products available for um, that. So for this project, uh, my undergrad research assistant, James, uh, designed and rigorously validated a LAMP eDNA assay for the detection of 12 high impact invasive species in Eastern Ontario, and we compared it to qPCR. Uh, we basically wanted to create a proof of concept for field ready citizen science friendly uh, LAMP assays. And we tested the assays in conditions challenging the qPCR and metabarcoding. Uh, so we did zebra mussel, quagga mussel, Eurasian milfoil, phragmites or common reed, um, European water chestnut, 
spiny water flea, rusty crayfish, Chinese mystery snail, round goby, tube nose goby, grass carp, and sea lamprey. We didn't expect all of them to work perfectly, but we wanted to hedge our bets. So we designed 12 primers for LAMP and qPCR on blast from um, different sequences on GenBank and Bold. We validated them in silico on blast, optimizing the annealing temperature for qPCR. Um, we tested sensitivity with um, synthetic DNA standard curves, and we tested specificity on related species with um, synthetic and tissue extracted DNA. So this is um, four out of the five levels of validation for um, uh, testing a qPCR assay. And the, for the final level is testing it on actual samples, but we didn't have mock communities to do that on. So first we optimized our qPCR assays for annealing temperature to maximize limited detection. So we did that for all 12 species. And we tested our LAMP and qPCR assays for specificity in silico on extracted tissue uh, samples and synthetic DNA. So just because um, an assay is uh, specific in silico, which means that they had at least five mismatches uh, on GenBank, doesn't mean that they'll be specific um, in real life. So as you can see in qPCR, only two out of 12 assays were specific, even though all 12 of them passed in silico. So only zebra muscle and quagga muscle. Uh, surprisingly, we thought zebra muscle and quagga muscle would co-amplify, but they didn't. Um, and then for LAMP, uh, 10 out of 12 were specific. So LAMP right off the bat, even with minimal testing, was much more specific than qPCR. And this is qPCR without a probe. Uh, we also looked at the limit of detection for our LAMP and qPCR assays through testing them on a 10 times dilution standard curve uh, from two, to the, 2 times 10 to the 4 to 2 times 10 to the negative 1 copies per microliter. And um, unfortunately, LAMP had a, a much worse limit of detection than qPCR. Uh, in most cases, 10 to 100 times less sensitive. However, we did get some assays which were very sensitive for LAMP. And the variation in sensitivity for different LAMP assays was also huge. Um, so Chinese mystery snail, uh, quagga mussel, and Eurasian milfoil was uh, sensitive up to two copies per microliter, which matched some of our qPCR assays. But others were uh, so not sensitive that they could only detect um, DNA at 200 copies per microliter. We also compared the time it took for each assay to achieve detection at a starting template concentration of 10 times, uh, 2 times 10 to the 4 copies per microliter. And LAMP performed very well in this regard. So around half of our reactions uh, were faster with LAMP than qPCR. So with zebra mussel, uh, Chinese mystery snail, quagga mussel, rusty crayfish, and European water chestnut, LAMP achieved faster detection than qPCR. And for some of them, it achieved detection very, very quickly. Uh, quagga muscle det achieved detection in only 12 minutes. We also did a cost comparison of our assays. Um, so we looked at the cost of apparatus, uh, the cost of the primers and probes, uh, the master mixes of reagents, and sample processing. So for cyber and probe-based qPCR, you need a qPCR machine. Uh, we use the CFX96, which costs around $30,000. Um, LAMP theoretically only requires a block heater, which you can uh, jerry rig for as little as like $10 to $20. As long as it reaches 60 degrees, um, it's fine. And the reaction is terminated by heating it up to 85 degrees. Uh, for primers and probes, uh, the cost of primers is pretty much negligible. For qPCR, it's around 10 bucks for a thousand uses. For LAMP, um, you need more primers, so it's around $25. And then probe, of course, is very expensive. Uh, TACMAN probe is $360 for a thousand uses. And then reagents, uh, qPCR with cyber based is uh, fairly cheap at only 55 cents per reaction. Uh, LAMP is the second cheapest at $3 per reaction, and the probe based qPCR is um, $330 per 50 microliter reaction. So LAMP is more expensive for re reagents, but the cost of apparatus is much, much lower. And then for sample processing, um, QPCR often requires very pure DNA, and um, commercial DNA extraction kits are very expensive at $12 per sample for a Kaijin power water kit. And then uh, LAMP has been shown to work on other species with just tissue homogenate, uh, which would cost almost nothing. So in conclusion, uh, the sensitivity and time to detection of LAMP drastically varies and requires extensive testing with multiple candidate primer, primer sets. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do stats with um, what primer parameters uh, are optimal. Uh, with only 12 primer sets, uh, we didn't have the power. Uh, 
But anecdotally, we did notice optimal performance with GC content near 45% and a melting temperature of around 80, uh, 58 degrees. Uh, the sensitivity of LAMP can approach qPCR, while time to detection can be faster in best case scenarios, and specificity is usually better than dye-based qPCR, even about in vitro testing. And LAMP can be more cost effective after considering apparatus amortization costs. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we plan to do st stats for ideal LAMP primer characteristics after uh, doing more testing. Uh, we'd like to do more testing on non-purified eDNA and tissues. So uh, DNA extraction and purification is one of the limiting steps in eDNA. And if we can bypass this and um, have a quick and dirty method, uh, this would allow us to do testing in the field. Uh, we plan to do more testing in inhibited conditions. And overall, we hope to produce and test a field profile for an invasive species lamp assay. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was that was really great, uh, great information. So thank you for that. Um, we have a few more minutes for for any questions that might come in. Um, in the meantime, I was hoping maybe you could speak on the applicability of any of this uh, technology for community scientists, um, if this is something that could be used by the general public at all. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about, actually. Um, sure. So LAMP, what we hope to do is create something like a COVID test. Um, but for an invasive species. Uh, so for example, and technologically, this would be very simple. It would just be using a COVID test uh, that's already that already exists for LAMP um, and replacing the primers with an invasive species primer set that's been validated. And um, so we could distribute these to uh, things like lake associations um, and avoid the, the step of um, going through a lab uh, because sample transport is, um, a huge issue in eDNA. Uh, between sampling and actually processing the sample and um, lab work, uh, there can be a lot of degradation. Absolutely, that's really, yeah, that's interesting. Is it something that's kind of cost effective though for the most part, would, uh, would you say? Um, yes, so uh, a huge part of the cost of um, nucleic acid tests is actually the equipment. So even though LAMP costs more in terms of reagents, um, the lack of um, needing a thermal cycler can make it very cost effective. Interesting. Wow, that's yeah, that's great to hear that it's, uh, it might be more broadly um, applicable. Uh, we do have a couple comments coming in. Um, sounds very exciting, which is great. Um, and can't wait till we have these for freshwater lakes. That's great to hear. Um, and somebody's asking uh, a link for a link for the study paper. I believe that's, uh, that's on your end. So maybe you could answer that. Uh, offline when you have the chance, but yeah. 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 Um, otherwise, I think we can probably uh, wrap up for, for now. Um, we're, we're a few minutes ahead of schedule, but um, maybe that gives everybody a few more minutes for a little extra time. Thank you so much, Alan, for your presentation. Um, and we will be yeah, going to our next session uh, shortly. I'll pass it to Mackenzie to, to wrap things up. Oh, you're on mute, Mackenzie. <laughs> happens to the best of us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're heading into our next session at three o'clock. Uh, so you can join us there. It's going to be a continuation of research and management on aquatic invasive species. So you can take a bit of a bathroom and a refresher break. And we will see you in the next session at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you.